Welcome everyone to our webinar, Dual Sensory Loss in Older Adults, facilitated by the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. My name is Mariel Ang, and I am the Project Coordinator at the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation. ONF supports the Fall Prevention Community of Practice and its online platform called Loop. Loop is a place where fall prevention practitioners connect. Visit us at www.fallsloop.com. Marguerite Thomas also joins us on the line. Marguerite is the coordinator for the Fall Prevention Community of Practice. She will be assisting us with facilitating questions in the chat box today. Before we begin, I'm going to give you a quick rundown on the Level 3 meeting system. The webinar technology consists of two parts. The audio is provided through a telephone conference line and the visuals are provided through a web platform. The phone number for the conference line and the link to the web platform were sent to you by email after you registered for the webinar through Level 3. If you have questions about the technology at any time during the presentation, please type them in the chat box on the left hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can also email me at mariel at onf.org. I will work with you to resolve technical issues as soon as possible. This webinar contains opportunities for participation. There will be online polls throughout the presentation, which you will answer directly on your screen, and a question and answer period at the end. If you have topic-related questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. During the Q&A, questions will be read aloud to the group. If you would prefer to ask your question over the phone, we will provide the instructions to unmute your line during the Q&A. The webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be sent to all participants in about one week along with the presentation slides. I would now like to introduce our presenters, Angela Brown and Kelly Patterson. Angela Brown has been with DeafBlind Ontario Services since 2008. In various capacities, including intervener, facilitator, facilitator of community services, and currently as a facilitator of training, Angela has many years of experience within health and social services, is a registered sick children's nurse, and is a certified congenital deafblind specialist level two. As a facilitator of training, Angela works with the training team delivering organizations specialized touch TM training to interveners at DeafBlind Ontario Services. Kelly Patterson is the manager of client services and specialized training at DeafBlind Ontario. Kelly ensures that the organization's renowned service model is implemented, evaluated, and consistent and is responsible for ensuring completion of specialized training events and programs for over 250 employees. With over 20 years of experience in the field, she designed the organization's person-centered service model, the Community Services Sensory Exploration Arts Program, Accessibility Guidelines for Sensory Loss, a certification program for interveners through an accrediting body and continual evaluation and development to the specialized training program TOUCH training, ongoing, unique, committed, and holistic. She currently sits on the Intervenor Services Human Resources Strategy Education and Training Subcommittee. Kelly holds a Developmental Services Worker Diploma and is a Certified Congenital Deafblind Specialist Level 2. Without further ado, please take it away, Angela and Kelly. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, and thank you to the Fall Prevention Community Practice for inviting DeafBlind Ontario Services for doing this webinar on uh, aging and sensory loss. So Angela and I will be going back and forth uh, through different slides, and uh, as mentioned, we do have a poll question during our presentation. So just to give you a bit of an overview of what we'll be covering, Angela and I, during the webinar, we'll give you just a very brief background on the history of DeafBlind Ontario Services and who we are the impact of a sensory loss on someone who is aging, the prevalence of dual sensory loss and what those causes could be of sensory loss, and certainly uh, speaking to the webinar fall prevention, what are implications of having a dual sensory loss on safety and falling, and including any related strategies to that. So a little bit of our background of who we are at DeafBlind Ontario Services. We are an organization that supports uh, deafblind individuals and uh, who are um, looking at supporting them in their increase and improve their quality of life through specialized services. And this history began in 1989 
with motivated parents who lobbied to the Ontario government. Their children were graduating from uh, a residential school called W. Ross McDonald, Brantford, Ontario, that has uh, bl a blind individuals and deafblind residency as well. And at that time, uh, three locations opened uh, shortly in um, beginning of April 6, 1999. We were incorporated as a not-for-profit organization. And uh, we had nine, lo or sorry, uh, three locations and nine uh, people that we supported. Today, uh, we actually support 75 people across the province of Ontario through our residential services, so what began in 1989, to also community service partnerships um, as well. So as you can see, we span across. Originally, we were in the New Market um, area, which is kind of just north of Toronto. So when we start looking at uh, sensory loss, and looking at that definition, this definition came from the NHS in Scotland. Um, sensory loss is an inability or decreased ability to respond to stimuli that affects our senses. Obviously, we have many senses. We are focusing in primarily on vision and hearing at, um, at this webinar. And when we look at the information that comes to us from those senses, we see about 95% of that information uh, comes from our vision and hearing. Vision and hearing impairments are um, affected by medical conditions. There's many medical conditions and, and syndromes that can affect vision and hearing, but certainly um, they are the, uh, the most common age-related conditions affecting the elderly. When we also think about sensory processing disorder, perhaps we think more of younger individuals who are under the autism spectrum, but I think when we look at dementia and look at aging, we also have to look at that um, troubles that some people have in receiving and responding to information that are coming to them through their senses as they age. From uh, North Carolina Medical Journal, um, this is kind of an interesting statement that when we look at the vision and hearing loss separately, um, while vision loss has a negative impact on somebody's perception of their world, and hearing loss can diminish that person's mode of communication, and that can lead to isolation. When we look at that dual sensory loss, that gives a whole different uh, disabilities, a very unique disability when we combine that vision and hearing loss and that presents a whole new level of, of challenge and it can really compound the difficulties of either loss when we look at them together. When we think about seniors with a dual sensory loss, um, they certainly uh, have an increased um, safety risk. We're going to be talking more to, to um, the increased risk of falls in this webinar. Um, part of that can be uh, because they lose their ability to see their barriers at home or when they're moving around through public spaces. Um, they can't see those barriers. They also can't hear those people around them in their path, and that can certainly um, give a, an increased risk of falls. When we look at, at vision problems, um, we think about um, the risk of uh, increasing falls with impairing balance. We can also talk to hearing problems uh, impairing our balance as well. Um, also reducing the ability to perceive distances, see that spatial um, issues. And where we are in space, we really rely on our vision, but also we rely on our hearing for that. Sorry, I'm just trying to move the slide on here. There we go. So certainly, as Angela just touched on, there would be an impact on quality of life. And so some areas that we would see would be communication. So even just having a simple conversation with having that dual uh, sensory loss of having you know, difficulty hearing someone and maybe even seeing where that voice or where that person is. This would then have an impact, as you see the next point, on social, social isolation. So certainly just even simple things like a gathering, a party, being in a restaurant with background noise, that can impact having that uh, quality of life as well. When we relate it to the fall prevention, there certainly would be an increase um, 
of impact on mobility. So even just simple pieces of activities, daily living, you know, picking up a basket to take it to your laundry, uh, being able to see things on the floor, getting around even in your own environment if it isn't set up um, conducive to that dual sensory loss, which then would impact that health and safety. And back to socialization and communication, this certainly can have an impact on mental health and depression. Um, if you're not able to even do those activities daily living the same way you were uh, able before, this again can impact uh, this aspect and even the cognitive impact as well. So I'll give it back to Angela. So now we're going to ask, invite you to um, share some information with us. And if you could take part in the poll, the question would be is, do you support or care for an individual or individuals with a vision loss, a hearing loss, that dual sensory loss, so that vision and hearing loss, or neither. If you could uh, take the time to respond to that, that would be great. And we can maybe get a better idea of our audience and who's listening right now. I see some people are writing in the, the chat. Um, I don't know if you have access to the poll site, but I've got some people saying neither, both, dual, both, some neither, some both. And somebody says they don't have access to the poll. So thank you for responding even through the, the chat group there. We see we have lots of people that have as, uh, that are supporting or caring for people with a dual sensual. Some people that have near, but I'd like you to keep in mind that, you know, as we age, um, unfortunately, all of us are losing some of our vision and hearing. Ah, I see some poll, poll results now. So we have um, some vision loss, some hearing loss, some dual sensory loss, and once again, people that, that have near, neither. Okay. So I'm just going to move on to our next slide. There's a the, um, I guess you guys can see the, the results there. So we've got 73% that, that are supporting individuals with neither vision or hearing loss. So hopefully they'll, after this webinar, they can be well armed to um, keep this in their keep this in their mind because uh, we're finding a lot of people are not thinking about that dual sensory loss piece. So hopefully they can use this information in the future. Okay. So when we look at the, some stats that have come out of Ontario, these figures are based on the Canadian Institute of Health Information, the reports taken from the Continuing Care Reporting System and the Home Care Reporting System. Um, individuals with dual sensory loss were identified by having both vision and hearing loss. And the, for long-term care numbers, the residents in hospital-based complex continuing care were not included in the numbers presented. But as you can see, the um, 70,000 um, experiencing a dual sensory loss in long-term care and health care. And then when we look at um, 46,500 seniors that are living with a dual sensory loss receiving home care services in, in Ontario, those numbers are, are pretty high. You may also be interested to know that the inter uh, suite of assessments, there is a specific module for the assessment of dual sensory loss that is available. However, very few assessors are either aware of it or use it consistently. And I think this speaks to the fact that people maybe aren't thinking about that dual sensory loss when we're looking at the seniors in our community and how to support them better and certainly how to um, reduce that falls risk as well. Some more um, data uh, to share. Uh, these numbers are over a three-year period. Uh, it's also important to note that the numbers for each year are relatively constant and slightly increased over time. Uh, when we look at the, the projected numbers that uh, may increase in the number of seniors in our communities requiring serv service during, due to the aging baby boomers, the numbers of seniors with a dual sensory loss will also increase. So as you can see, there is an uh, increase in numbers over that period with those studies there. 
Now we're going to start looking at some causes of dual sensory loss and look at the impact um, that can uh, have on that individual and increase their risk of falling. Uh, we're going to look at some different eye conditions and the impact of that. My mistake, I have put retinitis pigmentosa on there. We will not be talking to retinitis pigmentosa. Um, if you would like more information on that, you can certainly get in touch with me. But um, that was my mistake for leaving that in there. So please accept my apology. Okay. So our first eye condition we're going to talk about is cataracts. Um, more than 2.5 million Canadians have cataracts. And with a cataract, as you can see from these pictures, the lens of the eye becomes cloudy and the vision may become blurry. They're often associated with aging, but cataracts do occur. Um, they are present in some conditions in younger individuals. And as you can see by this picture, um, the cloudiness of the vision uh, walking up a street, perhaps it would be very difficult to see um, an obstruction in your way or where the curb is, where there maybe is a dip in the, the sidewalk, and that could certainly increase the hazard of falls with cataracts. People with diabetes are at a, a really high risk of developing vision problems. And it's estimated that half a million Canadians have diabetic retinopathy. And as you can see from these uh, photographs as well, the impact on um, access to vision, uh, depending on where those blind spots are in somebody's vision, can really impact on walking around outside or certainly within the home as well. They would have to access those small areas where they had clear vision to uh, maneuver their way around their world. Glaucoma is the second most common cause of vision loss in seniors in Canada. More than 250,000 Canadians have chronic open-ended glaucoma, which is the most common form of the disease. And once again in these pictures, you can see that with glaucoma, there's an increasing loss of the peripheral vision. So that person is reliant on the vision that's central to them. So if they were trying to take in information from all around them, they would have to be moving their head all around the area and not having the access to the vision on the periphery of their vision could certainly cause falls and tripping hazards to them. Age-related macular degeneration is the leading cause of vision loss in Canada. There are about 1.4 million Canadians living with AMD, and macular degeneration causes problems with central vision, as you can see in the picture here. This can cause blurriness, can cause dark areas, or distortion of areas. And for many people, macular de de degeneration makes activities, reading, driving, and moving around, or seeing faces and identifying objects difficult or impossible. Once again, that person may have to be moving their head, putting their head at different angles to access that field of vision that is available to them, once again increasing their risk of imbalance and falling. Finally, we have stroke. Um, strokes can affect vision a number of ways, including, including decreased vision. You can see from the photograph at the top, in that picture, we don't have access to the vision on the right side. Obviously, once again, that person would have to be moving their head around to access what's around them. And the picture below demonstrates um, some double vision. And we can imagine how challenging it would be to walk down a street or walk through your house when you have double vision. It's very hard to identify uh, what's around you and what that potential uh, tripping hazard is. Another factor we must remember about stroke is sometimes um, that can impact on um, processing complex information. So if somebody was in an environment that was particularly noisy, that was busy, there was a lot going on, it might be very challenging for somebody after having a stroke um, to process that information and make decisions and make m movement around their environment. So when we think about 
those last few slides with the different eye conditions, when we look at a, a flight of stairs in somebody's home, you can see that perhaps the flight of stairs on the left may be very challenging to walk up or certainly walk down. Very difficult to identify where each step is and being able to get all the way down there without maybe slipping or falling could be challenging. The staircase on the right is well lit, it has some contrast, and it's a little bit easier to access where each stair is. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but certainly food for thought when we think about um, those eye conditions and perhaps the people that you're supporting or caring for, um, if you know what eye conditions they have, it might be worth thinking about that um, from the terms of the environment that they're living in. Okay, I'm going to pass over to Kelly now. So Andrew just spoke about causes of vision loss, but certainly as we talk about dual sensory loss, you would also have someone who has a cause of some type of hearing loss. So this can be through genetics or hereditary. It could be a viral cause, so for example, uh, meningitis. Meniere's disease is another example of a type of uh, disorder that could happen as a hearing loss. So it is a disorder of the inner ear that causes episodes in which you feel like you were spinning, so very similar to vertigo. And this can have fluctuating hearing loss from progressive to ultimately permanent hearing loss altogether. And you can imagine that would certainly have an impact with that vision loss that Angela has spoken to and then having that feeling of falling with the vertigo. Uh, Age-related um, hearing loss as well. There's industrial and no noise included induced uh, hearing loss. Um, Tinnitus, which is affects actually one in five people, and it's not a condition itself, but is a symptom of underlying condition. So, such as age-related hearing loss, an ear injury, or circulatory system disorder. And again, um, hearing that constant background noise of that ringing, which comes with that, uh, could impact again when we talked about quality of life, when we talk about communication, social isolation social isolation as well, and then stroke as well can be a cause of hearing loss. So when we talk, why, why would um, hearing loss impact on our uh, risk of falls? Um, in the uh, top right-hand corner, we have a nice balancing act with some, with some plates spinning there. Um, hearing loss can have impact on our uh, vestibular function. And that is the vestibular function is, is a balance mechanism within the inner ear. And it provides sensory information about um, spatial orientation or, or where you are in space. It lets us know about motion, how we're moving, and generally equilibrium and balance. Now we talked a little bit about that being impacted on with vision loss as well. So now all of a sudden we're layering it up with hearing loss and vision loss. Now that's impacting on our balance. Also, um, hearing loss um, can contribute to less environmental awareness to people, to pets, to other things that are going on around those individuals. So that really gives an increased um, risk of falls. If you don't know what's going on around, now let's layer on that vision loss as well. You're less aware visually of what's going on around you. So once again, that can certainly um, have an impact on falls risk. And then from a cognitive point of view, our mental resources aren't a bottomless well. So that means that with a hearing loss and a vision loss, we may have fewer resources left to dedicate to maintaining our balance, to processing information that's coming in around us. And so our brain can sometimes just start being overwhelmed with trying to make sense of all that information and all these new issues that, that our bodies are facing with the dual sensory loss. So what are some related strategies? What can we do? So when we think about um, getting um, assistive devices, so wearing glasses, hearing aids, uh, ensuring that the vision hearing tests are up to date on a regular basis as well. So if you think about the example that um, Angela had talked about glaucoma and it affects um, the, your pressure, your fluid of your pressure. So by getting this checked on a regular basis, it could be an indicator that glaucoma is developing, right? So you then would be able to get the prescribed medication, kind of the bottom one there that is needed um, to help in the prevention of this. 
uh, exercise regularly is really important to improve that balance of coordination, utilizing uh, railings and other mobility devices. So we think about, again, um, Angela's talked about the environment and even thinking about those stairs, so setting up the environment to be successful. And we're going to show you some examples of some kind of DIY things that can be done that can assist in that process. And again, acquiring about medications that may cause dizziness, um, knowing what those are and um, and being aware of, of that environment as well. So following on with some, some strategies, I know that right now with the AODA, accessibility is a pretty hot topic uh, around Ontario. And fortunately, we're seeing a little bit more accessible features around our communities. Um, so when we think about um, somebody with mobility challenges, and how we make an area accessible for them. Maybe we're thinking about a ramp, but how do we make an area accessible for somebody with a dual sensory loss? Maybe not the top of people's um, thought process, but for you now, you'll be able to start thinking about some strategies that, that we can all use to make something uh, an area much more accessible for somebody with a dual sensory loss. First of all, we're going to think about lighting. Improving lighting in the home, it not only makes it easier to carry out everyday act activities, but it can also reduce the risk of falls. From the Centre for Sight Enhancement, um, it stated as we get older, we need more light in our homes, usually about 10% more each decade. So thinking about lighting in that individual that you support or care for, how well lit is their home? Uh, natural light, it's wonderful. We certainly all could do with some sunshine right now. Um, but it's inconsistent, and sometimes it needs to be controlled. You know, when we think about somebody with cataracts, if they are, have that bright sunshine coming in through the window, there might be glare, and that could really cause a lot of issues, being able to, to see through that glare, to understand what is around them. And something as easy as a window blind can really help to control that lighting. Curtains are either open or closed, um, or drapes, sorry, as they say in, in this country. I'm using my Scottish terminology there. Uh, but certainly window blinds, Venetian blinds, can control the amount of light, the degree and the direction that light is coming in. Electric lighting comes in many different forms. And not only does it have to be on or off, we can have dimmer switches that can control that amount of lighting, but also we can have motion sensors. So if there's a dark, darkened area, or especially a darkened area outside, maybe to the approach to somebody's home, we could put uh, motion sensors there to illuminate that area and make it much more accessible and easier for that person to maneuver independently and safely around their environment. Um, Finally, task lighting is, is really important as well. So not only do we have a central light in a room, but we're looking at task lighting. You can have task lighting all over a room in areas which um, we, we need to access. When we think about falling, it can be around the kitchen, in the hallway, in the bedrooms, in the bathrooms. Um, lighting is something we definitely have to, to um, have at the top of our list where it comes to making something area accessible. So when we look at the environment, again, it's important to almost look at it from a different uh, different lens of color and contrast. And we can set the environment up to be more successful so that falls or being able to navigate in their environment more successfully. So that's color and contrast. Although many people who have a low vision can also experience decreased color and perception, it is still possible to use color to enhance independence, safety, and overall accessibility. So an example of this would be bright colors. So they're generally the easiest to see because of their ability to reflect light. Uh, you can see with that door handle and even the striping of the stairs uh, as well. Uh, when we think about uh, contrasting color, you can see with the light switch as well. So Angela spoke about lighting, so it's important that person can find the actual light switch to adjust it as well. So you can see the black on white. Uh, solid bright colors such as red, orange, yellow are usually more visible than just pastels. And lighting certainly, as Angela talked about, can influence the perception of colors. So a dim light can wash out some colors while a bright light can intensify others. And again, just in hopes that uh, you would have uh, less risk of, of falling and being able to um, navigate in their environment uh, easier. 
So now we're going to uh, talk a bit about organization. Uh, we have a, a very clean, clear area in the bedroom on this slide, so it's really um, useful to avoid clutter because I'm sure, you know, uh, clothes laying on the floor, shoes laying on the floor, if you think back to those eye conditions, maybe they don't have access to the vision, uh, their lower vision, so they may, may not be able to see any, see any objects on the floor that could certainly increase the risk of trips or slips or falls. Being consistent with where uh, places live, so it's much easier. You don't have to be climbing all over the place and searching, increased stretching over and tripping over uh, to find those um, items. And placing those items most frequently used in a much um, lower, close-to-hand um, environment. So somebody doesn't have to use stairs or steps to climb up to that cupboard to get their, their special bowl or their mixer down, make that much more accessible for them. And developing reg regular routines um, makes, gives a lot more comfort and um, accessibility when it comes to understanding where things are kept, the time of day, and just sticking to routines can certainly um, ensure people have a little bit more independence and knowledge about what's going on around them. So as an organization, we certainly believe in uh, accessibility to meet this dual sensory loss. So we have developed an accessibility guidelines for sensory loss, which you are more than welcome to download. You can see on the bottom of that slide, if you go on our website, uh, www.deafblindontario.com, you can um, download that guide for free. And uh, it certainly highlights uh, best practices above actually the building code. So when we build or we are doing any type of renovation, we ensure that the locations that people were supporting with dual sensory loss meet this accessibility. But in the back of that accessibility guide is also kind of that DIY. So just those simple things of changing out light switches, door handles, be, uh, color contrasting, to insert just simple uh, task lighting underneath uh, cupboards, and even when we, it's not necessarily to do with falls, but even looking at uh, place settings and color contrasting. So that can go even farther when we look at accessibility. But we had shown you a picture earlier of a toilet, actually, that had the dark, different color toilet seat. And if you think of somebody who their vision loss is, um, is difficult and their mobility is off and try and navigate to find that toilet uh, turning around can be difficult. And um, by having that simple color contrast can make it easier to navigate that. And just on, uh, to end on the accessibility um, challenges, we need to be aware of how tiny it can be for an individual that has um, impacted vision and hearing loss, how tiring it can be for them to consistently try to access the vision and hearing that they have. So making that environment much more accessible makes less demands on them, and so perhaps they are not as tired and exhausted by trying to maneuver around their environment with their dual sensory loss. So with that, we would like to thank you for listening to us. I believe that, um, oh yeah, we have our, our email addresses up on that slide there. If anybody has any further questions and wish to get in contact with us, we'd be happy to hear from you. And we hope you um, enjoyed our session. I believe we have an uh, opportunity for you to ask some questions. So please feel free and we'll answer as best as we can. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Kelly and Angela. Um, we can just give everybody a few minutes to start typing in their questions in the chat box on the left-hand side of their screen. Um, I do have one preliminary question um, that is asking about communications or communicating with persons with dual sensory loss. Oh, sorry, that's a question, as how yeah. would you communicate with somebody with... There are many different ways to communicate with somebody with a dual sensory loss, and certainly, I mean, that could be a whole other webinar. Um, I think it would depend on, on somebody's um, background, on their literacy skills, um, but there are lots of different methods of communicating. Certainly, if somebody has some access to vision, a nice black 
thick marker on a white pad if you're writing something down for them is a really easy way to communicate with somebody. Otherwise, there are many different ways of communication. Um, you could uh, print on somebody's hand, palm. Um, you could spell out words on their palm. You could use even concrete objects to get your point across. If it was, for example, time for uh, tea time, you could present them with um, a, perhaps a teacup, a mug, and as long as throughout the team or the family that that was a consistent um, mode of communication, then certainly you could get your point across that way. Um, but for people with literacy skills, um, they are more inclined to use what vision they have um, to access either pictures or um, written word um, to communicate. But certainly we have lots of information about communication if anybody would like to talk to, to either Kelly or myself about modes of communication. We're always interested to talk to anybody about that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions that are coming to the chat box. I see that. Jeanette is asking, um, are there any funding or is there any, any funding available for home adaptation? Um, I may, now let me just see, I'm looking at this. Is there any funding available for home adaptations? I'm going to pass that to Kelly. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. I had seen that people were in different provinces as well, so I'm not sure where this is coming from. Uh, but certainly you can contact your local CCAC uh, if you're in Ontario. Um, but there isn't, as I'm, I'm aware, there isn't specific funding to that. We're just looking at the questions right now that have popped up. Uh, there was a question that is, does Deaf Land Terror Services offer any support or services resources for patients? If so, are home visits possible or must the patient go to the office? Uh, we do have a community service um, that would be able to come out. It would be a fee for service because unfortunately this is not covered um, by the Ministry of Community and Social Services in Ontario if that's where this question is coming from. Uh, but certainly we would come out and uh, do some type of consultation and even just looking at the environment. I'm just looking at some more questions. Uh, do you provide... Oh. Sure. Sorry, it's Angela again. Um, somebody said, love the different to colored toilet seat. Great idea. And certainly I can speak to that as um, we, we suggested this to a long-term care facility with a gentleman who was having some issues um, in his bathroom. And um, they were delighted to show us their black toilet seats and what a difference it made for that individual. Um, such a simple little fix, but to... Um, from a safety point of view, you don't want a wet floor for slips and trips. So um, for that gentleman, it certainly provided him with his independence and confidence, again, um, a really easy fix. And the other question, do you provide service in people's homes, offering adaptation suggestions? I think uh, Kelly spoke to that already. Um, certainly, uh, Deathline on Ontario Services does have a community services, as Kelly um suggested, so perhaps you could uh, get in touch and it is fee for service, um, unfortunately, but uh, is, uh, is access to occupational therapy. Occupational therapists certainly are the ones to, to talk to. I don't know if, if their focus necessarily is on vision and hearing loss, but we'd be more than happy to um, communicate, to talk with, with NMG if they have any questions. Perfect. Uh, there are a couple of other questions in the chat box. Uh, how have hearing, hearing aids advanced recently? Is there funding for people who are not vets or who don't have insurance plans? Where it comes to hearing aids, probably the Canadian Hearing Society is absolutely the best place to go to um, for any kind of advice. I, would, I, I wouldn't like to give any wrong information about hearing aids and um, funding, but certainly the Canadian Hearing um, Society is, is where um, we would access for our, the clients that we support as well. So they are the experts in that um, field. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Denise Beaton is asking a great question. Yeah. In addition to contrasting colors, are contrasting textures ever used in design? If so, how so? That's a great question, Denise. Um, textures are so important to people that don't have access to the vision and hearing. So, you know, we certainly use different textures where it comes to um, orientation to a space. So that could be as simple as um, a textured um, plaque outside a room to indicate 
what room is inside. It may be that there's a little bit of toweling on the wall to indicate that there is a, a bathroom inside. It could be that there's a different um, flooring so it could be perhaps a laminate flooring going into a low pile carpet to indicate that there is another, um, we're entering into another space. Um, if you were using, using rugs, I know you people from the Falls community, rugs are maybe, it's maybe a bad word, rugs, but certainly they have to be fixed right down to the floor and screwed down so there is no risk of um, uh, tripping. But um, certainly we can use um, textures to transition people from area to area. I hope that answers your question, Denise. Wonderful, thank you. We have a, a few more questions. Okay. Um, is there teaching for the person who actually has the disability? Do you ever get clients who have this and mild or moderate dementia? Um, dementia is not really our area of expertise. Um, where it comes to teaching individuals that are deaf blind, um, the Canadian Helen Keller Centre is in uh, the GTA, so the Greater Toronto Area. They do offer some training for um, individuals that are deaf, that are deaf blind. I'm certainly worth contacting them. So that is the Canadian Helen Keller Centre in Toronto. Um, they work directly with the consumers. They would they would call uh, those individuals consumers. So they work directly with with the consumers. They have a kitchen on site where they do um, life skills, they do um, computer skills, uh, gardening skills, they do all kinds of stuff. So worth getting in touch with them and perhaps they have other resources as well. Wonderful, thank you. We'll keep going uh, with just a couple of more questions. Okay, I'll and hand you over to I'll give Callie the next one. Yeah, so if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, another one here, um, sorry, I'm just scrolling up here. What are some new, newer technologies that are assisting with the advancement of services for deafblind individuals? Okay, certainly uh, that's a great question. Um, there's actually um, the iPhone, the connection to that has been uh, any type of um, adaptive phone. Um, has been actually great advancement where we think about uh, trying to navigate yourself to um, a mall or a direction itself. They can actually have that information come up if you had someone who was a Braille user. It will feed that information through your phone itself. So that's a great tool that has come about. Uh, certainly being able to, for those that are in the uh, deaf community or using sign language, um, that assistive device, you know, being able just to simply sign now instead of having a third party through that communication. Um, they can visually see each, each other through the computer itself. Um, there's definitely been, um, just there's, sorry, I'm just going to clarify with Angela, there's some other assistive devices. So assistive devices that have been helping dual sensory loss certainly the phone of technology of GPS. Um, apps on the phone yes, now. apps on the phone as well, or you can use the iP iPad as well. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question, do you consult with staff in long-term care? Yes, we have. So the question is, have we consulted with staff in long-term care? Uh, long-term care and certainly actually recently within the last week um, Angela has done some training with uh, PSWs and uh, just to look at you know what that communication is accessibility um, just to look at again you know the types of eye conditions and being aware of how you're going to communicate with that person as well and with the hearing loss and sort of a great segue from that answer that you've just given, uh, what are some continuing education opportunities or training uh, courses for healthcare professionals who would like to improve their practice with individuals who have dual sensory loss and what are taught during these opportunities? So again, we uh, have our own training that uh, would be able to come out uh, that focuses on uh, senior and aging and, and, and uh, dual sensory loss. It is fee-for-service. 
Uh, we've had different organizations that have requested this training, um, more focused around probably the PSW training. And again, we look at um, you know what are minimum ways of being able to give that communication back and forth. What does dual sensory uh, loss look like actually for that person? So kind of a walk in the shoes of situation. We look at different uh, eye conditions, hearing loss, and what are some strategies related to um, to assisting that person, and certainly uh, mobility, so orientation and being able to know what's in your environment and how to get there safely is a big portion of that training as well. And if you were interested in that training within uh, Ontario, for example, you can, again, contact uh, Angela Brown, uh, and her uh, email address was, I believe, on the previous slide. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Oh, as I uh, just as I speak, there's uh, one other that, other that has come through um, from Mary. Are you also available for training for hospital staff? Certainly. We, I mean, the organization would be, again, it's <laughs> fee for service, um, but uh, we definitely would be able to do that. And we've also developed, I wanted to mention this, some our own communication devices that, again, um, if you're supporting someone who has lost their ability to communicate, it could be, for example, through a stroke, we've come up with our own little uh, kind of toolkit of communication that makes it easy, let's say, for the for the uh, nurse, for example, to be able to, you know, let the person know that meds will be given or think about color contrasting and a way to approach someone uh, in that environment as well. So I just wanted to add to that. But again, certainly uh, contact Angela um, and her email address is up there as well. Great questions, by the way, to everyone. Great. So Angela and Kelly, I just remembered, do you want to just um, speak briefly to uh, the virtual handouts that have been prepared for, the, uh, for this presentation that will go out at the end of the webinar? Uh, yes, yeah, so w there were some, uh, for example, the webinar, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to see which ones were presented. There is some articles and just some data uh, research that's been done on dual sensory loss and, uh, and around falls. Yes, and so she was just asking about uh, sharing information on that. So just some, um, again, some additional research that just accompanies our and yes, oh, that's right, sorry, and a tip sheet as well um, that is included with that package. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Marguerite uh, just has another comment and question. Uh, yesterday, Stratford EMS did a training for their staff about serving people with vision, hearing issues. Uh, or vision and hearing issues. Mm -hmm. They had the staff wear glasses smeared with Vaseline and used other devices. Mm -hmm. Do you use this type of community training with community responders? Yes, we do. So we do simulations of all type, and we definitely have we have goggles with different uh, eye conditions, actually. So ones that would um, be a simulation very similar to what glaucoma would look like, uh, you know, cataracts. So we have different um, eye conditions that would go on there, and then we use earplugs. And our simulations actually would involve things of everyday living that people would be involved in. You know, it could be even uh, trying to open up that med container, make a sandwich, um, you know, all of those, you know, just simply navigating in their environment, one that they know of and others that they don't and what that feels like as well. So, yes, we have lots of different types of activities that are, that are involved, hands-on activities that are involved in our training. Perfect. Thank you. I'll just give it one last um, opportunity for anybody to type in some questions in the chat box. And I'll just advance over to the question slide. Hi, sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> sorry, I've I just been handed the phone. So did, did somebody have another question? No. Oh, no, I'm just allowing our participants just another minute to okay. type out their questions if they would like in the chat box. Okay. I've also just advanced the slide there uh, to our questions slide. Okay. Um, oh, I saw someone had their hand raised in the web meeting um, online platform, and if you're unable to get uh, to unmute yourself off the phone, and if you'd rather type in your question, please do so in the chat box, and we'll uh, be happy to ask it for you. And uh, oh, Renu Minhas has asked a question: Are there degrees of dual sensory loss? 
So I just want to answer, so there was a question around are there degrees of dual sensory loss, and certainly there is. Um, we support, as we would call, total total. So we do support individuals, uh, but the percentage is low. So out of 75 people, I would say there is probably 10% that we would consider total total. So that means absolutely no vision, no hearing at all. Um, so what that degree has to do with um, is that, and that would be we are supporting people that are congenitally deafblind. So that means they've been deafblind since birth. But what we are talking about is maybe acquired as well. So that could be that, again, they've lost their vision due to um, a genetic uh, vision condition, for example. And then, as for example, um, actually when you turn over 40, your macula starts to dry up. So everyone at some point, as Angela mentioned, would have some type of vision loss. And then that hearing loss could be from work-related or age-related, especially today when we think about that new generation putting those lovely little earbuds into their ears. That is also impacting their hearing as well. So what that degree looks like is dependent on the person, but the key piece here with dual sensory loss is the fact that um, neither makes up for the other. So even if you had a little bit of vision and you're able to you know, kind of see the person coming at you, it does not make up for that lack of hearing and vice versa. So you have a little bit of hearing, but it does not make up for that lack of vision, which again still um, falls under that dual sensory loss regardless of what that degree is. I hope that answers the question. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so we do have a few more minutes if anybody would like to type in their questions in the chat box um, for anything else that they have. Um, that they would like to ask our presenters. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to thank both of our presenters, Angela and Kelly, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I especially enjoyed your recommendations for amending environments within the home, including uh, using lighting, color, and contrast um, and organization. I think these are all really great age-friendly suggestions that we can all apply to our everyday lives. Great. Thank you. And thank you for having us. Absolutely. Um, Oh, Margaret is asking to please show the slides 32 onwards. Oh, no, those slides are not applicable for us. So um, those are for another presentation there. Um, so we're getting a lot of thank yous coming into the chat box. Um, and as well, I'd like to thank all of our participants today for joining us and engaging in a great discussion. For more information about the fall prevention community of practice, please visit us at, on loop at fallsloop.com and that website um, you can see on your screens uh, right now. Please don't close the chat box or the, uh, your window just yet. Wait until you have been redirected to the next screen where a brief evaluation survey will launch in your browser. We'd appreciate if you could provide us uh, with some feedback so we can continue to offer high quality webinars. Thank you all, and uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat box, so I think we're done for today, um, and have a wonderful rest of your day. See you next time.